Good day, everyone. It is Tail Time Thursday. While we haven't done an NGN case study since, I think, March 14th, middle of March, had a little hiatus, took some time off, and we talked about that on on Monday, uh, how to stay motivated and keep motivation going. So today, let's look at a good NGN case study for today. All right, so Thursday is all about case studies and how to understand the the NGN skills. There's six NGN skills that you will be tested on for the NCLEX exam, whether it's LPN or RN. So case studies usually tell us a story. So I think of them as a story. Um, And so um, there's a little um, acronym, little tip that I use for that. But we'll do that on another day. But anyway, these stories tell a tale, T-A-L-E, uh, about the patient or case event and we must know how to use the nursing process to develop the plan of care. A lot of times these questions are asking you what's going on with the patient, what is the assessment, what do we think the diagnosis is, what's our plan, what's our intervention, all those things. So today's case study is dedicated to my pediatric students out there, um, nursing students. I get a lot of nursing students that say, I need help with pediatrics, and pediatrics is tough. So according to the NCSBN, the leading regulatory excellence of our testing for nurses, they call, uh, they had in a publication, the Next Generation NCLEX News, they talked about the bow tie. So bow tie items will always have a maximum score of five points, always. They look like this bow tie. There's two parts on the left, two parts on the right. There's one section in the middle. They're asking you of two actions that you need to take, two parameters that you're going to monitor, what condition most likely this patient is experiencing. You want to start in the middle. You want to first focus on what is wrong with this patient, all right? What is wrong with this patient? And then you move on to actions to take. And actions to take, with that option, you want to focus on how do I fix this problem? What will help this patient? What do we need to do to maybe confirm the diagnosis? And you want to take the two most important actions, the priority. The actions are going to help lead you to the parameter to monitor. So if an action was give the patient furosemide, a parameter I need to monitor is urine output or strict strict I's and O's, something like that. So points are going to be earned by selecting the correct tokens from their respective lists and placing them on the correct targets. Tokens for the action to take and parameter to monitor can be dropped in either of their respective targets. So as an NCLEX NCLEX candidate, you're going to select both of the correct tokens for the action to take in the example type and you could have dragged them to either of the two actions to take doesn't matter which order and I guess in this example they had only got they only got one point for the parameter to monitor so that would only give four points so they don't take away a point that's a good thing you get partial credit for these types of questions so I love that part about it but in total you can get up to five points all right So let's read through this and we may have to break up this um, video a little bit so you're not having to get bored with it and and keep, you know, prolonging it. But we'll probably discuss the um, the topics and the answers um, a little later. But I want you to think about this video of think about this question and try to answer it. So the nurse is caring for a pediatric client and we're going to do some highlighting. Highlighting is also a part of the NGN test plan. You may have to highlight things. So I just start practicing highlighting things. So it's pediatric patient and we see that they're three years old. All right. Now, let me tell you before we go forward, we did go through what the question is, the query. But my test tip, what I recommend is that when you get a case study usually they're going to have like the starting part of the case event on the right or on the left and on the right they'll have the question 
which is your query. Go ahead and read the query first. Know what you're dealing with. I usually see people start on the left and they start reading information. They go through all that and then they go back to the right. Then you still have to go back to the left. You may end up doing that anyway, but it's just, it gets your brain trained to start looking for certain information if you go ahead and read what the question is asking you. So start there first. That's usually a little bit easier. Okay, had to make a correction here. I had the incorrect, um, what do you call that? The bow tie. Had an incorrect bow tie. So if you were looking at that previously at the very beginning and thought, what in the world? This doesn't seem to be adding up, but, uh, but, but it will. Um, we got it corrected now. Okay, let me go back to my highlighting. So always do that first so our conditions that we're most likely experiencing it's either celiac disease it could be colitis it could be functional constipation or Hirschsprung disease all right so we know we're dealing with one of these so as we read now our brain is already trained to think about what condition is this child potentially experiencing all right and then now for each of those um depending on which one it is, there are going to be actions to take. And you're only, only going to choose two, the two most pertinent priority. Either we need to increase diet, dietary fiber, prepare for barium enema, administer osmotic laxative, or administer prophylactic antibiotic, or keep the patient, the client, NPO. All right, parameters to monitor. You have um, five parameters. We're only going to choose two. Do we need to monitor their electrolytes? white blood cell count, their stool pattern, their hemoglobin, or their perianal, perianal area. All right, <clears throat> so now we can go back to our highlighting. This is a three-year-old client that was brought to the clinic for concerns about constipation. All right, so they have a history. They were treated for encopresis six months prior no known allergies okay don't freak out if you see a word that you're not familiar with go with what you know you do know what constipation is you know your client's developmental age is three years old they were treated for something six months ago prior if you're not really sure if you if you know what that is great that might even help you even more and they have no allergies all right the next part you're going to click on the nurse's notes and I almost feel like I want to click there, but I have to go to my next slide. And then we read our nurse's notes. All right. So remember, this is a three-year-old with constipation. Pay attention to time, especially if they give you different time frames. But we only have one. At eight in the morning, client is alert, oriented, and interactive. Caregiver states, my son is having trouble with constipation again. All right. So sounds like this has been a recurrent problem. He is straining and cries during a bowel movement and his stools are quite large. He tries to avoid going to the bathroom as much as possible. Probably because it's so uncomfortable. Poor baby. All right. Heart S1, S2. No murmurs auscultated. That's normal. Brachial pulse is plus three. That's even greater. Um, so plus two is okay, but plus three is, is really good is normal skin is warm dry bilateral breath sounds clear to auscultation that's great abdomen appears normal hypoactive bowel sounds times times four quadrants so not really good peristalsis going on in his um, bowels mass palpated in lower left quadrant so you take your belly and think about what's over there lower left quadrant that's where there's a mass stool noted in rectal vault so they probably checked them um, maybe they did do a rectal exam and checked them rectally and they're noticing stool. Yeah, because now they say the anal tone. You can check anal tone that way as well. Anal tone noted to be open and distended. Sorry for the background. If you, I don't know if you can hear that noise, but we have some people cutting their grass today. It's a beautiful sunny day. Faces pain scale 0 to 10. So for a toddler, you would use the faces pain scale to assess are they really hurting. So at the moment, he seems to be comfortable. All right, 38 inches tall, 16 kilograms in weight, developmental, developmentally appropriate. Now we're going to look at vital signs. All right, and we didn't do a lot of highlighting for there, but let's go back. Straining and cries during bowel movement. Stools are quite large. Avoids going to the bathroom. Having trouble with constipation again. 
um, everything else was pretty normal, but we didn't like this hypoactive bowel sounds and this mass in the lower left quadrant. He's got stool there, anal tone is okay. All right, no pain. All right, so his temperature is good, 98.7. Heart rate's pretty typical for a toddler, 96. Respiration's 24. Blood pressure, 96 over 50. So his vitals look pretty good. He's breathing fine, 90% on room air. So we have to focus in on what is wrong with this child. For a typical child, um, let's see, we have a toddler. We actually have a toddler. So, and our toddler is between that age, two to four. So breathing 30 is pretty normal for them. A little bit high heart rate is okay, 120. And yeah, he seemed to be nice and relaxed. So that 96 is probably in that lower norm range. And we'll look at Saunders to see what they have for where you can find your vital signs. Respirations, 24. And someone asked that too, but it's right there in Saunders. And I'll show you where to go to find that. All right, everything looks pretty good there. So that's all the information we get. And just like NCLEX, it's a little vague, but we should have enough information. Typically, you have everything you need in the question, in the case event, to answer the question. So what do you think this is? What do you think is wrong with this three-year-old? Is it celiac disease? Is it colitis? Is it functional constipation? Is it Hirschsprung disease? Well, one thing we notice is they say the child is constipated and yeah, it sounds like he is constipated. Um, we're not, you may not be sure about that encopresis, but we are going to look at that. So go with what you know, go with what you know. If you're thinking it says he's constipated, sounds like it's constipation, go with that. Now you want to also be able to, to differentiate what other reasons, uh, what reasons would it not be celiac? What do they really say? What's the NCLEX language when they want you to think the patient has celiac disease? Usually they'll talk about the food that he's eating and what problems they're having then. What about colitis? What about Hirschsprung? So we're going to talk a little bit about each of those so we can pull away the differences and really bear down on what is going on with this child. All right. We'll take a few more minutes here to discuss um, a few words and maybe look at some things in Saunders. All right, to get to vital signs in Saunders, um, if you look in pediatrics, you, you won't really find it in there. So go to Growth, Development, and Stages of Life. This is the ninth edition, chapter 19. On page 251, it starts with developmental characteristics. And depending on what age you're looking for, you just find their developmental stage. All right, our child in our case event is a two-year-old, so that's a toddler. So if you look here, they give toddler vital signs. And between ages one and two, they talk about the head, head circumference and how that increases per year until age five. Ages, ages 12 and 18 months. I'm trying to see if they have a general guideline for toddler. Typically toddler is um, two to three. And I think on our slide, we said two to four. Uh, but be careful because preschooler is really that four-year-old age. So a little bit different. I would go with three to four for your preschooler, even though their vitals may be a little bit similar. So that might be why they just kind of group the vital signs in that on that slide on the whiteboard screen. But since we know that this is a um, toddler, we're going to look at those toddler vital signs. All right. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So temperature, his temp was fine. 97.5 to 98.6 is normal. And just looking back, I'm kind of looking back at the other one. I know you can't see that board, but his their temperature was 98.7. It was a little boy, three-year-old. All right, their heart rate was 96, and so they said the apical heart rate should be 80 to 120. 
His respiration is 24, and we see here that respirations are normally 20 to 30 breaths per minute. So they breathe a little bit faster than what we would think of, of as an older child or adolescent or an, an adult, more, more closer to an adult would be the ad adolescent. All right, the older teenager. Blood pressure for this three-year-old was 96 over 50. And we have here on average, their blood pressure should be 92 over 55. So he has a, a good blood pressure, about average. Pulse ox, 99%. I think that's pretty much universal, no matter who you are, what age, or what developmental stage. All right, so what else can we look up that we needed? All right, so we had a few things that we wanted to compare. All right, let's look at celiac disease. All right, and so how I use this tool is I go into my search and I type in celiac disease and see where it takes us. All right, and sometimes you want to go just specific to the topic, so you just click until you get there. So celiac is under gastrointestinal problems. It's chapter 34 in the pediatric section. Pediatric um, is the orange section. Celiac disease is also known as gluten entero, uh, enteropathy or enteropathy or celiac sprue. Celiac disease, you may have already remembered that it's something to do with eating. So that's a good one to eliminate. All right. So what you want to remember about celiac is it is an intolerance to gluten. Gluten is a protein component of wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Um, celiac disease results in the accumulation of the amino acid glutamine, which is toxic to intestinal mucosal cells. So those patients are going to have acute or insidious diarrhea, very opposite of what this child is experiencing. He's experiencing some constipation. Steatorrhea is usually like fatty stools. They're anorexic, abdominal pain and distension. He did have a little bit of, um, didn't really say he had pain, but he did have hypoactive bowel sounds. And I think the left quadrant, left lower quadrant was a mass. All right. He didn't have any vomiting, anemia, irritability, muscle wasting. I mean, it didn't say anything else. It didn't say what he's eating. It didn't say he only has problems after he's eating. A celiac crisis is precipitated by fasting, infection, or ingestion of gluten. So that's what we would have expected, that if they wanted us to think the child had celiac disease, that he would have eaten some form of wheat, barley, rye, or oats, and all of a sudden had problems, profuse, watery, diarrhea, vomiting, um, and then we would be monitoring for dehydration, electrolyte imbalances. And when you're pooping a lot, remember you're losing base, below the waist losing base. So that person would have, um, could develop severe acidosis because you get rid of all your bicarb. All right, so that's celiac disease. Okay, and so we said that would probably be a good one to get rid of because typically that deals with um, a food intolerance. All right, now it might have gotten a little bit tricky, but I would have still gone with what I know. If they said the poor kid's constipated, we have functional constipation on there. More than likely, that is it. But we just want to, you want to study each question, go through and learn. It, it helps you to see what things are you not familiar with. So you'll know, um, you know, you'll, you'll gather more information and you can be able to, to study the content a little better so that next time you know what to deal with and what, um, you know, you, you have more information to go off of. The more you know, the more confident you're, go you're going to feel. All right, they don't give us Crohn's as an option. So let's go back to our pediatric section and let's go back to GI. All right, so let's see if we can find some more. So that we talked about celiac. Here's Hirschsprung's. So 
So notice it's not really in pediatrics because when I think of colitis, I do think of an older patient. I think of adults more so. So let's talk about her sprungs while we're in this section. All right, and we do have constipation in, oh, there's that word, in copresis. All right, her sprungs. Okay, there's a picture. Whew, it's like a mega colon. It's a distended colon. This is the sigmoid that's distended. That looks horrible. All right, so her sprungs disease is congenital anomaly anomaly <laughs> can you say that word three times fast anomaly <laughs> but it's abnormal the child is born with it also known as congenital agangliosis or a ganglionic megacolon the disease occurs as the result of an absence of ganglion cells so they lack these ganglion cells in the rectum and other areas of the affected intestine well, what does that cause? Well, it causes mechanical obstruction because they don't have those cells. So however they work, they work in, hel in helping motility. So there's inadequate motility in an intestinal segment where those cells are absent. The disease may be um, a familiar congenital defect, can be associated with Down syndrome, other anomalies, and genital urinary abnormalities. The most serious complication is enterocolitis. Signs include fever. This patient didn't have any fever, severe prostration, GI bleeding, explosive watery diarrhea. Can be mild or moderate. Assessment. All right. So this person would probably be like this in at birth. Um, newborns are going to be able to, uh, would have a difficulty passing meconian stool. So they fail to pass that. That's the very first stool after birth. Uh, refusal to suck or feed. Abdominal distension. Bowel stain vomitus. For children, they fail to gain weight and they have a delayed growth, abdominal distension, vomiting, constipation, alternating with diarrhea. So possibly, but it doesn't sound like he's been doing this. Well, I don't know. Has he been doing this since birth? He's three years old and they said constipated again, but they didn't mention he's having an issue with vomiting versus diarrhea. Uh, I mean, vomiting or constipation versus diarrhea, alternating between the two. Ribbon-like foul smelling stool. They don't mention any of that. So it's least likely that it's going to be Hirschsprung's disease. He did have a mass. So I'm wondering about this mass and it is on the left lower portion, but that could be where the stool is and then it's stuck. So I thought about that when we saw that picture um, of her sprungs that they had earlier. All right. These people would need low fiber diet, high calorie, high protein. Uh, parental nutrition may be necessary in extreme situations. Stool softeners, daily rectal irrigations, promote adequate elimination and prevent obstruction as prescribed. All right, let's look at one more section here and then we'll probably go into colitis. But let's look at constipation. This is what we're thinking. Constipation is the infrequent and difficult passage of dry hard stool. Now, when you think of the word functional, it sounds like functional to me sounds like, okay, you are functioning, you're doing what you need to do, but you're still having a problem. So functional, it sounds like he's going, but when he has to go, it's very difficult. It's a type of constipation that has no physical or physiological cause. Usually it's kind of idiopathic and it is chronic. Um, it can be primary constipation as well. It's characterized by fewer than three bowel movements a, uh, a week. Um, usually they have hard stools, difficulty or pain in defecating, and incomplete emptying of the bowels. All right, so let's see what Saunders says about this constipation. Encoparesis, encoparesis is constipation with fecal incontinence. So it did mention that the child was recently had a history of that and recently was treated for that. Children often complain that soiling is involuntary and occurs without warning. So they can just suddenly have 
stool that comes out and they're incontinent and and then they kind of go between constipation but then they have this fecal incontinence all right if the child does not have a neurological or or anatomical disorder encopresis is usually the result of fecal impaction and an enlarged rectum caused by chronic constipation so it may be why because that's the descending colon closer to the sigmoid maybe why the left lower quadrant of his abdomen has this mass and they do mention here palpable movable fecal masses abdominal pain and cramping without distension normal or decreased so he had two things here he had decreased bowel sounds there was this palpable mass in the left lower quadrant um, he didn't have any nausea vomiting or headache that i remember and they did say previously he had this encopresis and for that, we would see evidence of soiling of clothing, scratching or rubbing of the anal area, fecal odor, and social withdrawal. All right, what do we need to do for those patients? They need a diet high in fiber and fluids to promote bowel elimination. Select fiber foods considering the child's likes and dislikes. So they give us a box up here that are foods high in fiber. That's your whole grain breads, um, cereals, your vegetables, um, cooked or raw, your fruits like prunes and raisins and raw fruits, and some beans, legumes, high fiber snacks, popcorn, nuts, and seeds. They need to decrease sugar and milk intake. They may need an enema. We're going to monitor some electrolytes, hypernatremia, hyperphosphatemia when administering repeated en enemas. Uh, we especially want to watch for signs of hypernatremia and hyperphosphatemia. And they give us some signs and symptoms here. They may need stool softeners or laxatives. Encourage the child to sit on the toilet. Sometimes you got to sit for a little bit, right? Don't just rush off. And that seems to be a problem. He doesn't even want to go to the bathroom and sit because it's so uncomfortable but after they get those enemas or those laxatives when they feel that urge they really need to sit there for five to ten minutes 20 to 30 minutes after breakfast and dinner to assist with defecation all right so colitis um for that one we typically see that with they did mention a little bit about enterocolitis and i don't think we've seen colitis um, anywhere else um, for the G for the kids but there is this ulcerative colitis that you'll see in the GI problems for adults which is ulcerative and inflammatory disease of the bowel results in poor absorption of nutrients uh, colitis is characterized by various periods of remissions and exacerbation now what are their symptoms they're gonna have anorexia weight loss malaise tenderness and cramping in the abdomen severe diarrhea may um, contain blood and mucus malnourishment dehydration electrolytes we're going to monitor those things they can have intermittent fever vitamin k and anemia so yeah he didn't have any of those types of symptoms he did not have severe diarrhea he was suffering from constipation all right so i think we agree that we have our answer so now we just have to figure out what are the actions and what are the um, parameters that we're going to monitor. So going back to that section, you may be able to figure out from there. All right, so we're going to follow up. I don't know if I'm going to add to this video. It's been a little long, but I think we're just going to follow up with the answer. See if you can figure out what this answer is, how to complete this bow tie. And we'll follow up tomorrow. Tomorrow is Fun Fact Friday. We'll have some fun facts and we'll start out with answering this case study. Enjoy and have a wonderful, wonderful evening.